Good afternoon and welcome everyone joining us for today's webinar on corruption in fisheries, a key obstacle for resilient oceans organized jointly by the International Anti-Corruption Academy and the Fisheries Transparency Initiative. We are very happy to host you today online together with our esteemed speakers on this very important and urgent topic who will address the key drivers of corruption, the effects and different approaches to tackle this global problem. My name is Petra Suschitz and I'm responsible for the general management at the Academy and will guide you through today's discussion. Please note that this webinar will be recorded and later shared on IACA webpage. All questions can be addressed to all speakers during the whole session, but we will answer them uh, only in the end during the official Q&A session. Please note that during the session, our speakers will try to answer some of the questions using also the chat window. So you can freely ask, comment on anything during our discussion. And also uh, one more point to mention during our session in the end, uh, we will uh, give an opportunity to you to join directly to our panel, to our panelists, and to ask, raise your questions directly using the camera and sound. So stay with us until the end. Before we open, before we start the panel discussion, allow me to take a moment and introduce shortly the organizers of today's webinar. So, as I mentioned, the Fisheries Transparency Initiative is a global multi-stakeholder partnership that seeks to increase transparency and particip participation for a more sustainable management of mar marine fisheries. It provides governments, the fishing industry, both large scale and small scale, and civil society with an internationally recognized framework to increase the credibility and quality of national fisheries information. By making fisheries management more transparent and inclusive, the Fisheries Transparency Initiative promotes informed public debates on fisheries policies and supports the long-term contribution of the sector to national economies and the well-being of citizens and businesses that depend on the marine environment. Uh, the International Anti-Corruption Academy is an international organization and the post-secondary educational institution based in Luxembourg, Austria. It was established on 8th of March 2011, and to date the Academy has a constituency of 79 parties, comprising of 75 UN member states and four international governmental organizations. As of August uh, this year, we will uh, join a new member state, and in total we will have 80 parties. IACA aims to deliver anti-corruption education and training for professionals and practitioners from all sectors, while forging partnerships to develop anti-corruption initiatives, provide technical assistance as, and serves as a platform for exchange and dialogue. The Academy offers two online master's degree programs in anti-corruption, compliance and collective action, and a uh, master in anti-corruption studies program and international master in anti-corruption compliance and collective action program. These are <coughs> interdisciplinary courses and focus on both theory and practice in the fields of law, economics, political science, sociology, and behavioral science. Applications for our 2020 academic uh, programs are available on IACA webpage, and the programs will commence with studies mid of October this year. In addition to the uh, academic programs, IACA also offers International Summer Academy and Regional Summer Academies trainings for professionals in anti-corruption and related fields. Multiple tailor-made trainings also organized throughout the whole year, also in the online format. This year, online International Summer Academy will be delivered from 5th to 11th of September, and you can find more information as well as applications uh, available online at IACA webpage. Before I introduce to you the panelists for today's discussion, I would like to ask the Dean and Executive Secretary of IACA, Mr. Thomas Stelzer, to address us with his welcome remarks. Mr. Stelzer has been a member of the Foreign Service of the Republic of Austria. He has served as permanent representative of Austria to the United Nations Office in Vienna, the International Atomic Energy Agency, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, and the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization Preparatory Commission, and more recently as Ambassador to Portugal. He also served as Assistant Secretary General for Policy Coordination and Inter-Agency Affairs at the United Nations and as the Secretary of the United Nations Chief Executives Board. Mr. Stelzer worked in the areas of international security and disarmament issues, as well as development cooperation. 
He was also special assistant to the executive secretary of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization. The Dean, thank you very much for joining us today. The floor is all yours. Welcome. Thank you very much, Petra. Uh, I welcome all the participants of this webinar. Uh, happy to greet you. Thanks for the introduction, which might have been longer than my introductory words to this webinar. Uh, you might ask yourselves why IACA is getting involved in fisheries. You know, IACA was established to facilitate implementation of UNCAC. During the last 10 years, we've been concentrating on building our academic pillar. We have been offering academic programs to master's programs. But of course, with the onset of the big crisis of the COVID crisis, we all had to rethink and re-establish and reposition ourselves uh, and reinvent our, the way we are delivering our products. So we have repackaged all of our contents, our expertise into an e-learning base, which we're offering now to our participants on five continents. Now, of course, implementing UNCAC also means facilitating implementation of the SDGs. You, uh, fight against corruption is one is involved is uh, part of one of the SDGs, SDG 16, target five. But it, it is it is uh, uh, an issue which has an impact on all the SDGs. And as you know, fisheries are under big threat. The complexity of fisheries of the fisheries sectors, which often involves long supply chains and multiple jurisdictions makes it particularly vulnerable to illicit activities, just such as illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, money laundering, human rights violations, tax avoidance, and any other crimes. One factor that can be transversal on these crimes is corruption. This is why we are very happy to co-host this webinar today. Uh, I hope that you will all find the responses to the issues that you're looking for and the wish of fruitful participation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dean. So before I, uh, we continue with the discussion, I will now introduce to you our speakers today. We have here with us Mr. Nick Brannigan, who is based in Edinburgh, Scotland, and he works for Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs Fraud Investigation Service. Dr. Brannigan has specialized the field of economic crime in fisheries and in 2017 was named the UK's Government Counterfraud Professional of the Year. This recognized his work to tackle all aspects of crime and fraud along the fish industry supply chain, which has boosted tax, tax receipts by 30 million pounds. He is currently chair of the North Atlantic Fisheries Intelligent Group, which is affiliated to the OECD and aims to combat economic fisheries crimes. Thank you very much, Nick. Welcome. We continue Thank you very much. with our next speaker, Ms. Leda Tochi, is a program officer at the UNODC Global Program for Combating Wildlife uh, and Forest Crime. She is based at UNODC headquarters in Vienna, Austria. Ms. Tocci coordinates the work of the program on fisheries crime, including the delivery of both normative and technical assistance in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Before joining the UNODC, Ms. Tocci's experience include working for the private sector, non-government organizations in the areas of global security and environmental crime, as well as the Foreign Service of Albania. The UNODC Global Program for Combating Wildlife and Forest Crime works to improve the criminal justice and preventive response of member states to wildlife, forest and fisheries crime. The program focuses on policy guidance and technical assistance in several areas such as strengthening national legislation, building up state scientific investigative prosecutorial and judicial capacities, and establishing internal mechanisms to undertake financial investigations and anti-corruption programs. Ms. Tochi holds a Master of Science degree in env Environmental Technology and International Affairs from the Diplomatic Academy of Vienna and the Vienna University of Technology. Leda, thank you very much once again and welcome. Thank you, Petra. We proceed with Mr. Sven Biermann, who is the Director of the International Secretariat of the Fisheries Transparency Initiative based in the Seychelles. The Fisheries Transparency Initiative is a global multi-stakeholder partnership 
which seeks to increase transparency and particip participation for the benefit of a more sustainable management of marine fisheries. Throughout, Sven is also co-founder of the Humboldt Viadrina Governance Platform, a non-profit organization that strengthens participation and transparency for sustainable solutions of societal challenges. Throughout his more than 20 years of professional experiences, Sven has been focusing on practical and sustainable solutions for good governance, multi-stakeholder partnerships, corporate social responsibility, risk management and business integrity. In 2012 to 13, Sven served as the senior advisor to the United Nations Global Compact, 10th principle on anti-corruption. Prior to this position, Sven spent almost 10 years with the global consulting company Accenture, as well as multiple years as the director of the anti-corruption projects at the Humboldt Viedrina School of Governance. Sven studied finance, taxes, auditing at the Technical College in Trier, Germany, where he graduated in 1998. Sven obtained also a Master of Business Administration with a major in information, information management from the University of St. Thomas in Minnesota, USA. Sven, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thanks, Sabine. We proceed with our next speaker, Mr. Eduard Ivano, who is a frequent visiting lecturer at IACA and a visiting professor at Direito in Sao Paulo, Brazil, the University of Nice in France, the University of Münster in Germany, and the National Research University High School of Economics in Moscow, Russia. He is an expert and published author in combating corruption, terrorism, money laundering, and in uh, AML, CFT, and anti-corruption compliance. In 2016 to 2019, Eduard was a member of IACA's academic team. From 2013 to 2015, he was a chair of the Anti-Corruption Research Group at the Law School's Global League. From 2002 to 2008, Ivano served as the head of various units in Rosfin Monitoring in Russia and was responsible for financial investigations and international cooperation. He was also a co-chair of the working group on typologies in the Eurasian group on combating money laundering and financing of terrorism as, and as a member of the FATF's working group on typologies. From 1999 to 2002, he served as a head of unit for inter-regional operations at the inter-regional tax inspection for operative control of problematic taxpayer. He holds a Doctor of Sciences degree from Lomonosov Moscow State University. He has a solid practical experience in combating economic crime and corruption in the fishing industry and seaports. Eduard, thank you very much for joining us once again. Welcome. Thank you, Petra. So uh, now we can proceed with the topic of today's discussion. Uh, today, as you know, our fisheries resources are under threat. World Wildlife Fund reports that two thirds of the world's fish stocks are either fished at their limits or overfished. And cities cite statistics from the World Food Organization, according to which 70% of the fish population is fully used, overused or in crisis. Some would go as far as to suggest that corruption risks and challenges are far greater in the fisheries than in other extractive natural resources sector. The sector provides direct income for about 60 million people and for another 750 million indirectly. It also plays an important role in the conservation and sustainable use of the ocean and other water resources. The complexity of the fisheries sector, which often involves a long supply chain and multi multiple jurisdictions, makes it particularly vulnerable to illicit activities such as Ill illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing, money laundering, human rights violations, tax avoidance and other crimes. One factor that can be transversal to these crimes is corruption. Effective governance is therefore, uh, of fisheries is therefore crucial for the well-being of our oceans, rivers and food chains. Nevertheless, there are many opportunities for corruption which makes the trade in and consumption of fish a threat to sustainability as well as a generator of poverty. During our webinar today, our speakers will address three main points during their presentations and discussions on what are the key drivers and enablers of corruption in the fisheries sector, what are the consequences of corruption in the fisheries sector, and what are their recommendations and proposed solutions to the problem of corruption in the fisheries sector. 
Once again, I wish a very warm welcome to all of our speakers. And as a first uh, speaker, I would give floor now to Nick, who will take over and uh, introduce to you part of his experience. Thank you, Nick. Uh, thank you and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think a good starting point for this discussion is last year's UNODC report, uh, Rotten Fish. Um, when working on this report, we noted that there are very few published cases involving corruption in fisheries. Notable examples include the South African rock lobster case, the Codfather case in the United States operation, Enredados in Brazil, and the current uh, fish rock case in Namibia. Uh, but given the size and global importance of the fishery sector, the incidence of corruption appears to be very low. Um, but um, I don't think this right, and it, it cannot be right. Uh, and for some reason, corruption in fisheries is underreported. The, the question is, why is this? Um, one reason may be that the sector is complex and requires specialist knowledge to understand it. So it may be very difficult to detect when things get, are going wrong, and it may be difficult for law enforcement to investigate what is actually going on. Next slide, please. As has um, already been discussed, um, corruption is just one aspect of fisheries crime. Um, corruption will often be associated with other criminal activity. It is important to appreciate that we should not only be focused on illegal, unreported and unre unregulated fishing. Other crimes that can occur along the value chain include fraud and forgery, labor exploitation, human trafficking and slavery, tax and customs offenses, and money laundering. And crimes associated with fishing, exploiting the fact that fishing boats move about a lot um, at sea include trafficking of people, drugs, arms, and so on. Um, corruption is the lubrication that allows the criminal machine to work. Uh, so measures taken to reduce corruption will make that criminal machine more difficult to operate. Next slide, please. Right, uh, so we've already mentioned the value chain or supply chain. Um, because fisheries can be so complex, it is useful to use the concept of the value chain uh, when assessing risks along that chain. And the diet, oh, sorry, yes, sorry, that's, that's right. Um, um, uh, so the diagram on the screen now is a very simplified marine capture value chain. So we have various stages. We have the preparation, fishing, landing, processing, transport, and the sale of the fish. Um, again, it's important to stress that real actual value chains are complicated and will vary depending on fishing methods used, the target species, location, and season. So um, in reality, it is very, it is a, quite a difficult job to actually map out a value chain and to analyze it in detail. But understanding the value chain is essential to identifying the risks. It is important to note that uh, policing the value chain will involve multiple agencies within a country and probably agencies in more than one country. So we're interested agency and cross-border cooperation is, in, is, a, in, is essential when evaluating the risk along the value chain and also um, combating any illegal activity that takes place. Um, so let's have a look at some of the stages in more detail. From a corruption perspective, the preparation stage is significant. Um, in order to fish, you need a boat, you need a crew, you need licenses and quota. And obtaining licenses and quota can be opportunities for corruption. Um, a, a good example currently is the ongoing investigation in Namibia, where we see a multinational apparently making corrupt payments to government officials and others to obtain a monopoly on quota for in a particular fishery. That then allowed that multinational to divert profits from the operation to a tax havens. So the host country did not receive any benefit from the fishing activity that was taking place. The fishing stage is where much illegality can occur, but the risk of corruption is much lower. 
Um, that is because until you actually land your fish, um, you're not going to make any money. And it's the, so the landing stage is a critical, is the critical point in the value chain. Um, any risk as, as, and this is where you have to start your risk assessment process in some detail, because this is usually the start of the official record. So if the documentation relating to the landing is incorrect for any reason, then everything else that happens along the value chain, the documentation trail thereafter, is, always, is, is also likely to be wrong. So getting the landing stage right and understanding what needs to be done and what checks need to be carried out and how that is done is critical in understanding um, the, the process. Um, transport and processing, again, are important because th these can happen in more than one jurisdiction. And if that is true, then product is crossing borders. And crossing borders is another checkpoint. And, and, and if, it, if it is an official checkpoint, if it is an official process, then uh, corruption is possible. So um, analyzing all these steps and understanding what's happening in wherever you are and whatever fishery you're looking at is critical. In, uh, in understanding what could go wrong. So if we can move to the next slide, please. And, um, and this, this, this diagram attempts to sort of uh, reinforce that, this, this point. Um, in the top half of the diagram, you have a legitimate uh, uh, value chain. In the, in the center, you have the fish flowing from boat to plate and moving through several steps in the transactional process along that value chain. Uh, below that, you have the documentation tra trail. So every single step along that uh, chain is documented. And above that, at the top, you have the money moving. And you notice that the money is shown as a wedge uh, increasing from left to right because that reflects the fact that the amount of cash in the system in the value chain increases as you move towards the consumer, but also that usually the profit increases at each of those steps. And um, in, the, in the lower half of the diagram, um, this is where something is going wrong. So if you don't understand what's happening in, a, in an idealized value chain or what should be happening, Looking at the top half, you're not going to be identify, you're not going to identify properly what could happen when things go wrong. And in the lower half of the diagram, you see a value chain where there are effectively two criminal attacks on that value chain and money is extracted at both of those uh, points. Um, note that the overall amount of money involved in that value chain is the same. And what the criminal extraction does is actually reduce the amount of money available to legitimate pr processes. So um, criminal attacks um, on that value chain are to the detriment of your uh, legitimate traders, your, your legitimate uh, activity along the chain. Um, a very simplified uh, example of this is if a supermarket um, acquire, purchases frozen fish, defrosts it, and then sells it as fresh fish. Um, that allows it to massively increase its profit, but also charge a premium price, but undercut its competitors. Now they have to react to that. So they will um, uh, reduce their prices um, to, to uh, match what the, um, the supermarket is doing, uh, which means that um, there is an overall price status or price reduction uh, of the legitimate retailers. And this will mean that the primary producers, the fishermen, will receive less for their catches. Um, I think now Lady is going to talk about um, the risk assessment process in more detail. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. So we proceed with the uh, webinar with discussion. Leda, please, uh, if you want to continue, the floor is yours.
Thank you, Petra. Uh, my presentation will be, in fact, um, a continuation of what uh, Nick uh, presented uh, in terms of the value chain, and we'll be focusing on the, the UNODC rotten fish uh, approach. Um, the rotten fish guide was published uh, last year um, and uh, has been the basis of a risk assessment and development of risk mitigation strategies uh, in a few selected countries. Um, and uh, a few other countries are interested, so we'll be starting in, uh, in a couple more very soon. From a UNODC perspective, uh, corruption uh, is one of the fisheries-related crimes. Uh, it also enables a series of other uh, fisheries crimes. Um, these crimes uh, fall in the category uh, of uh, not of IAU fishing per se. They're very often connected to IAU fishing and occur at the same time with IAU fishing, but we call them fisheries related crimes based on the diagram that uh, Nick uh, showed to you and uh, explained. Um, UNODC uh, as the guardian of the United Nations Convention Against uh, Corruption and the United Nations Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime is um, key in supporting member states in addressing these crimes. It is therefore complementing the work on uh, uh, IEU fishing that uh, other agencies just such as FAO, uh, which is uh, a close partner of ours, is, uh, is conducting. Let's look first at the, the, the reasons why the fishery sector is particularly vulnerable to corruption. Uh, it is so mainly because of three aspects. Uh, first is the global nature of the fishing industry. Um, unlike uh, other industries such as, for example, diamonds or precious metals, which are localized, the fishing industry is truly global. Um, all countries are, are involved uh, to some extent in uh, fishing import, export or production. Therefore, if we have uh, corruption in the fisheries sector, um, in one part of the fisheries industry, it will uh, immediately have an effect across the globe. Um, and in addition to that, there's also a lack of uh, centralized regulation. We have around 150 coastal countries, uh, and each of them has their right to choose how it uh, regulates the sector and how it, uh, and how it controls its uh, exclusive economic zone. The second reason is that the fisheries resources are depleting very quickly. Um, this uh, results in increased competition. There is a lot of money being involved and lots of profits being involved. Therefore, uh, often fishing operators uh, engage in corruption or other illegal uh, activities in order to gain an advantage over their competitors and maximize their profit. Um, and the third one is the lack of transparency that characterizes the sector. Um, owners uh, of fishing vessels can register them in the in the countries where strong privacy laws exist or countries that cannot regulate their fishery sector effectively and therefore they protect their identity and uh, uh, the identity of, uh, of the actors that engage in uh, corrupt practices. Um, Next slide, please. Yeah, but why, why is this important? Uh, and here I have uh, a few figures. Uh, Petra in her introduction mentioned uh, a few of them. It's, uh, it's clearly because we are dealing with a, with a sector that is of big strategic importance. Um, according to the latest FAO report, the world fisheries and aquaculture production in 2018 was estimated 401 billion US dollars. There is again an increase from the previous period. And this clearly shows the economic importance of the, of the sector. This is particularly the case for developing countries where um, their, uh, their proportion of the global total of fisheries-based experts is 54% uh, by value, 60% by quantity. So that's, uh, that's a lot. And uh, that means that corruption and other fisheries crime in this sector do impact these countries more than others. Um, while uh, fisheries uh, can be a major provider inc of income for developing countries and for coastal communities, 
its contribution to the GDP of these countries still remains very low and below its real potential. Uh, just the other day, uh, there was a, a recent report from, from Somalia, for example, where a recent study estimates that IU fishing in Somalia's EEZ is accounting for more than 300 million US dollars in loss. And uh, the output of the fishing sector in Somalia, it's, it's not even half of that figure, and it's 2% of its GDP. And to put that into context, we are talking about a country that has 2,000 miles of coastline. Um, and it has an estimated 2.7 million people fi facing crisis levels of food insecurity. Therefore, fisheries is particularly important for these countries and these communities. Um, a major sector of uh, employment, a major sector of uh, livelihoods, both uh, directly and indirectly, uh, important for uh, food security. 17% of the global population's intake of uh, animal protein for developing countries, this figure is much higher. It's around 50%. Um, and uh, lastly, it's taking a toll on, uh, on fish stocks. Um, it's currently estimated around 34.2% of fish stocks are currently overfished. And uh, the situation in, uh, in some hotspots, it, it's, uh, it's even way more severe than that. Um, these figures show us that uh, on the one hand, uh, the sector is clearly very important for the economy, for the environment, and for the livelihoods. And at the same time, it is at the center of uh, illegality and illegal activity, including, including corruption. And despite the fact that there is a very small body of uh, knowledge or cases on corruption, um, we have reason to believe that uh, corruption is there and it's, uh, it's very much present. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about the UNODC approach to the corruption risk assessment and management on the rotten fish. Um, it's a new approach. It's one of the first resources on, uh, on corruption in fisheries that it's currently being implemented uh, in a few selected countries. Uh, it's designed to help uh, policymakers uh, with identifying specific areas uh, within their legal and uh, regulatory frameworks that are vulnerable to corruption. Uh, it also aims at raising awareness, sensitizing authorities. So we think it's very important to, to, to make sure that uh, different stakeholders understand the real impact uh, that corruption can have in this sector. Um, it does focus mainly on addressing corruption risks. It does not assume that corruption is there. Uh, it's, uh, it's looking more at the risks of corruption. Um, it's targeted at an organizational level. Uh, usually it's focused on uh, one organization in a country, such as the Ministry of Fisheries, for example. But for, uh, for smaller countries, it can be also on an industry level. It's completely country owned and country led. It's led by a working group of experts uh, from different agencies in the country uh, with facilitated by, uh, by UNODC and external experts. And uh, all of the activities are carried out by that specific agency and there is minimal su external support. Um, next slide, please. Yeah. Um, it uh, is based on three uh, main uh, steps. Uh, it's identifying a small number of risks that the organization has the capacity to address. Um, and uh, the capacity here is very important because very often we see a large number of risks that are being identified. But of course, the resources are limited. So there is a need for prioritizing those risks. Um, the next step is the creation of capacity within the organization to manage an ongoing corruption risk management pr uh, process. And this can be done, for example, through a corruption prevention committee. And lastly, it uh, institutionalizes corruption risk management within the organization's strategic and operational processes. Um, as we see from, from these three steps, the process is quite uh, 
ambitious and uh, it's a long-term commitment by the country. Therefore, it's very important that the authorities in the country are committed to this process and there is political will in the country to engage in this process. Um, in this slide, I will very quickly uh, walk you through the different steps of the process. As the first step, it's the establishment of a working group. The working group needs to be relatively small, so it still remains efficient, but it still needs different uh, expertise because, uh, as Nick explained, we're looking at the whole value chain and therefore it's important to have expertise and actors involved in different stages of the value chain. Um, this uh, is uh, the, the, the establishment of the context, and the context is exactly analyzing the value chain that is specific to the country, and analyzing the different actors, the different agencies that are involved at different stages of the value chain. The second step is the risk identification, where the working group creates a list of potential scenarios based um, either on the risk of corruption or in actual known cases of corruption. Um, this is where it's important to have a broad range of, uh, of experts in the working group because uh, actions of one agency will always have an impact on the work of other agencies further up or down in the value chain. Um, once the risks are identified, they need to be analyzed. Some, some of the risks may be associated to weak or even non-existing controls. Um, in these cases, even if there is no corruption that it's known, there is a potential there. And of course, sooner or later, someone will take advantage of it. Um, on the other hand, uh, if we have overly complex rules and regulations, we know that that's also a possibility and for a high risk factor for corruption, such as bribery, for example, to, to, to happen in order to avoid the, the complex bureaucracy. The next step is the risk evaluation. Here, uh, the working group looks at all the risks identified and decides on the likelihood and impact of each of the risks. And this is being done through a matrix and enables the prioritization of risks. As I mentioned earlier, it's really important to prioritize the risks because the resources are limited. And uh, this approach assumes uh, from the beginning uh, limited uh, resources. And finally, uh, the last step is uh, risk treatment, where the working group will review all the procedures, all the rules, all the practices that are in place and determine how effective they are to address the identified risks. And in that case, very often the working group will propose additional ones, additional mechanisms to, to address this risk. Um, Next slide, please. Um, the risk assessment is then followed by the development of a mitigation plan. Um, and you'll see in this uh, graph how the risk assessment itself feeds into the mitigation plan. Um, the aim is to, to develop a detailed plan and uh, that includes uh, responsibilities uh, allocated to persons, it includes uh, target dates and it includes also resources needed, including financial resources. Um, and finally, uh, it's very important that in order to achieve success in the long term with the process, it's critical to oversee the implementation of the plan. Uh, and this is, of course, not a one-off process. It, uh, it requires consistent efforts over, over a period of time. Next slide, please. Um, in this slide, you will see how uh, the outcome of the corruption risk assessment process looks like. Uh, and here, for example, the risk uh, identified is bribery of inspectors. And the working group uh, itself decides on the likelihood, the impact, the level of uh, each and also on the justification, on the reason why this is happening and why the impact or the likelihood is high or medium or low. 
uh, it goes on and looks at the causes. In this uh, case, it can be the current system uh, is manual, for example, or poor supervision. And uh, the analysis of the systems in place will then enable the working group to see what additional steps are needed, whether it's an automated system that it's needed, whether it's technical assistance that it's needed because there is lack of training um, and lack of capacities. Um, it decides on a timeline and it uh, is very important to have a responsible individual or a responsible uh, section within, uh, within the organization that is responsible. Examples uh, of risks identified in the countries where we've started implementation uh, range from uh, outdated fisheries legislation, non-compliance with the legislation, um, lack of adequate training, insufficient number of uh, observers in the fishing vessels, misuse of patrol vehicles, uh, etc. And of course, the responses to these risks are also different. They can range from a budget increase to uh, technical assistance and training to review of the fisheries legislation, uh, equipment very often, installation of uh, tracking systems, uh, etc. Next slide, please. Um, Lastly, I want to conclude by uh, underlining the importance that uh, the risk management plan and the response uh, contains both a preventive approach and a law enforcement approach. Um, corruption um, in fisheries um, has particular importance to have a preventive approach because when um, when uh, fishing companies or actors involved in the fishing sector um, or established businesses uh, seek to increase their profits, very often a preventive approach is uh, very useful and effective. But on the other hand, if we have uh, established organized criminal groups involved, then prevention will not be so effective and uh, the focus should be on law enforcement. Um, on uh, the preventive approach, there are two important points, uh, and I'm very glad that uh, Sven of uh, Fisheries Transparency Initiative will uh, uh, present after I conclude, because increasing transparency uh, is, um, in our view, key to uh, in the preventive approach for the risk management plan. Um, the other one is uh, awareness raising and education. We've seen that it's very important that uh, that the experts, the stakeholders that are involved in the fisheries sector or in the different stages of the value chain have an understanding of uh, how corruption can be manifested, what the loopholes are and the, what they can do to address it. Uh, but it's also important to raise awareness among the general public. Um, uh, if they understand the, the cost of corruption in the fisheries sector, if the general public understands how much the economy is suffering from it, then they will be less likely not only to engage in, the, uh, in corruption, but also to tolerate uh, corruption by others. Um, when it comes to law enforcement approach, uh, strengthening uh, law enforcement frameworks is important, in particular, as Nick mentioned earlier, interagency cooperation is key. Uh, very often we see that all the agencies involved in the stages of the value chain do not speak to each other, do not work together, and it's very important that uh, every approach and uh, every step uh, to, to, to improve the situation, not only about corruption, but also on fisheries crime more broadly, does include all the agencies that are involved. And uh, the other one is the conducting parallel financial investigations. Um, they can provide information, guidance, proof of corruption, um, the monetary trails of uh, bribery or illicit profit are there. So therefore, it's, uh, it's, usual, it's useful to, to look at them and to use them to help investigators and prosecutors. And um, lastly, I want to conclude um, again by reiterating that it's very important to look beyond IEU fishing 
it's very important to recognize that there are transnational organized crimes involved in the fisheries sector. Um, corruption, uh, fraud, forgery, tax evasion are only some of them. And uh, if we do not address them, then it will be very difficult to succeed also in our efforts to address IAU fishing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leda. We move forward uh, with Sven. Sven, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Petra. Um, thanks for the introduction. Uh, and also thank you to Nick and uh, Leda for this uh, brilliant handover. I fully agree um, that the actual amount of corruption in the fishery sector is, is not clear. Uh, and the reason why I'm saying this is, I think there are three key aspects that speak for that. Number one is, as we've seen, there's a lot of money involved in the sector, uh, which usually attracts also uh, criminal activities. The sector in itself is fairly complex. And again, complex is breeding ground for, uh, for corruption. And the third thing, and I think that makes it different from, from other uh, sectors where there's also lots of money to make and uh, complexity, fishery somehow has escaped the, the spotlight, the, the attention. So I think we're just seeing now uh, an increased attention on illegal activities, uh, corruption-related activities uh, in, in the fishery sector. So I'm happy that we have this conversation here as a, as a kickoff on this uh, fairly important topic. Now, as you would have probably guessed, um, coming from a global uh, transparency initiative, I'm going to talk more about the solution aspect uh, of corruption in fisheries, and in particular on transparency as a mitigation uh, activity. As you see on the um, screen a statement from the FAO, it shows that the lack of transparency is an underlying factor of many aspects uh, that harm uh, the sustainability of fisheries. Sadly, I would say again, you know, this statement, even though it could have been written today, is, is 10 years old. So, I think that is one of the aspects we may want to address in, in the Q&A and how to get a bit more uh, urgency on, on these uh, topics. But if you see um, transparency as an uh, underlying facilitator, it can also be um, a solution. And as you um, see on the next slide, typically transparency is more or less linked to the aspect of increased oversight, which will lead to uh, increased uh, accountability. But in the fishery sector, the necessity of transparency stems from, from multiple aspects. And I would say accountability and oversight is just uh, one of them. Another key aspect is the saying that you often hear, what gets measured gets done. Well, if things then don't get measured, um, then you, these aspects don't gain much attention. And we have that quite often in the fishery sector where there's a lack of transparency in particular, when it comes to the economic and social contribution of small scale fishing, of the role of women uh, in the value chains, especially in the, in the post harvest sector. And we lack basic transparency on, on their contribution. And quite frankly, uh, in, an, in a time where we're now, where large economic stimulus packages are being put together, you don't want to be uh, in a sector that falls out of this. Uh, attention and does not get um, the right uh, the right attention to be to be addressed. Another point, uh, just to pick one or two examples from from this list, is um, the spread of concerns and rumors. I think this is this undermining of trust is a key aspect that does not get enough attention as we're focusing primarily, usually on the economic uh, numbers, but the fishery sector is a difficult sector as the resource is not seen. Uh, it's happening underwater. Uh, fishing activities are usually not seen from the people on land because they're happening you know, past, the, uh, past the horizon. Nevertheless, people want to know what, are, what is the status of our sector. And if there are no credible information that addresses these, uh, these questions, rumors are gonna spread of uh, you know, certain involvements, certain mishandling of the sector. And I think that is something that we need to be um, very, uh, very crucial of. Now, 
making it very clear, and I think it is a bit self-evident, but I nevertheless want to emphasize it, not every country that lacks uh, transparency should be seen you know, as a corrupt country. Uh, there are rational reasons for a country lacking uh, transparency, uh, lack of resources for collating data, for, for publishing data. There is still, quite frankly, a lot of legal uncertainty on when information can be published, when it is seen as commercial sensitive, when it invades um, privacy rights, etc. cetera. Um, obviously, they could also be seen as um, convenient excuses or not to provide transparency. So we really need to address the matter of transparency in, uh, in a careful and well uh, thought through um, manner. Now, the question then comes, what do we actually mean when we're talking about transparency in fisheries, in particular when it comes to a mitigation activity for addressing corruption? And as you see on the, uh, on the next slide, that is actually something I feel uh, there's a bit of confusion on, on, this, on this aspect. And it might stem from what Nick and what uh, Leda said uh, also. We've seen quite a bit of attention over the last few years on illegal fishing, you know, catching the bad guys on, uh, on the ocean. And that is uh, transparency in itself, the, making the activities of fishing vessels that either do not have a license, to fish in, in the waters of a country or have a license but are not supposed to fish in a certain area or at a certain time is an important aspect of transparency in fisheries and initiatives, for example, like our colleagues from Global Fishing Watch have made significant contributions to ensure the sustainability of, uh, of the sector. But in itself alone, it's not sufficient because there's also you know, legal overfishing, just to, make, uh, just to make an example. So in addition to know what the fishing vessels are actually doing when they're out in, on the ocean, you know, as, as Nick mentioned in his simplified diagram, you know, this is then the second stage on, on fishing. We need to know what, who is allowed to be out there, under what conditions, what was their financial contribution? Um, are there any conditions um, for, for fishing? So, as a, I would say, a baseline aspect when we're talking about transparency, we need to have transparency on the management uh, of fisheries because a lot of these aspects can provide an enabling environment uh, for corruption uh, in itself. And then a third aspect that we you know, summarize under this term of transparency in fisheries is product traceability or value chain traceability. And that is something you know, Nick outlined you know, very good on you know, the, the different stages when the fish actually lands in the ports and uh, until it ends up on the plate uh, of the consumers. So what I'm trying to show here is that we need to be a bit more careful when we talk about transparency in fisheries, because some may just think about technology tools to monitor vessel movements. Um, other mean, uh, a label on, on the product, and other may uh, focus more on the financial and the sustainability aspects of, uh, of fisheries management. So we need uh, a comprehensive approach. I think you can clearly see if we have just one of these three bubbles here, this is not going to be enough. Just having clarity on the rules does not show us what, um, what the vessels are doing uh, on the ocean and vice versa. But we also need to be clear that, for example, when we do a risk assessment, and we understand where our risks are, uh, different mitigation activities and strategies will come out of this. And uh, some may be technology-based, some uh, may be more um, work, working group, multi-stakeholder-based, et cetera, but it's important to differentiate uh, the, various, the various aspects on this. Now, if we go a little bit further into the management of uh, fisheries, what is it actually that we want to see in the public domain um, as a way to, um, to prevent uh, corruption? And again, if you consider the traditional approach of countering corruption, preventing, detecting, and, and responding, that is a, there's a whole range of information that you would like to see from a corruption point of view um, 
to be made transparent. So this is just an example. But one of the key groups that I would say is extremely prone to corruption is what Nick had in his initial slide, the preparation phase. When it comes to negotiating, actually, who has the authorization to go fishing? We still see in, in many countries that agreements between one country and another country or between a country and private companies, they are not publicly available. Some of them are not even known, um, especially you know, uh, foreign fishing access agreements still face a lot of um, scrutiny because some of them are not being published and not being publicly available, which again, that means you don't know under that agreement who is allowed to fish, what was their contribution, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that spills over to other aspects that are then not made transparent, like uh, a vessel registry uh, that clearly shows these vessels are allowed to fish under these conditions, that was their financial contribution, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we see, for example, some of you who follow the fishery sector a bit, there was a lot of discussion in, in Senegal uh, the other day about additional licenses you know, being promised to be given um, to, to other fleets. And I'm certainly not saying that corruption was involved in this, but with more transparency behind it, uh, I think the whole process would have perceived completely, uh, completely different than from the opacity that a lot of people take away from this, uh, from this approach. So payments for fishing, again, is an important aspect not just focusing only, quite frankly, on you know, the commercial sector. Um, we see a lot of countries where recreational fishing, um, sport fishing, for example, is a major source uh, of income. Yet, it's often not completely reflected in budgeted, etc. So payments for fishing is equally important as recorded catch data. Nick made the point that it's absolutely important to know how much um, catch is landed, does that make sense to the amount of fleets that uh, have gone wrong fishing, uh, etc. One aspect that I wanted to outline here a little bit is the aspect of beneficial ownership. And it, it links to what I said earlier, that the fishery sector somehow has escaped international attention. I mean, we've been talking about beneficial ownership, I think since the 2000s, uh, probably already uh, earlier, with other sectors, for example, in, in oil, gas, and mining, taking this aspect of who is actually the natural person who ultimately benefits from a transaction much further. There's much more um, attention on, on this aspect, on this important aspect. And it's for the fishery sector, it's not only important from a um, countering crime perspective, um, but it's also to effectively implement policies. Because if you don't know who is the ultimate owner behind a fishing authorization, behind an, uh, an agreement, etc., we may see foreign uh, investments dominating uh, national fisheries. We may see economic concentration on just a few, even though if you look at the sector, it seems it's, it's fairly uh, diversified. And that aspect, I think, again, is, is crucial if we Want to, have, want to make sure or want to contribute that sustainable fisheries policies are implemented uh, in, in a long-lasting uh, long way. Now, when we look at that, um, I think we, there's a lot of agreement on transparency being a key tool on, on countering corruption. But likewise, we have to say it's not Transparency is not a silver bullet, as you can see on the, uh, on the next slide. So I want to spend um, one or you know, two minutes also on the aspect of a critical reflection, because we also have to make sure to understand there are many situations and instances when trans transparency disappoints. So let me just go into four of these, uh, these examples. Uh, we see a lot of data dumping and hiding uh, behind complexity. If you ever try to analyze catch data that was provided by a regional fisheries management organization in, in one of their huge Excel sheets, you basically know what I mean. It makes, it takes you literally a day to make some sense of the data. So while they would claim, yes, we are transparent, the data is there, 
it's really difficult to understand what's the current situation. What does the information actually actually tell us? So there, there is something of an information overflow, and we have to avoid that when we're talking about transparency as a solution. Propaganda and self-marketing, I think, is pretty clear um, to people who work in the government, but also work in, in the private sector. I have written certain corporate social responsibility reports, and the ones that you write and the ones that get published, they look fairly different um, because it becomes a marketing tool and the, the array of words that we have to discount these activities from greenwashing to bluewashing to whitewashing, the color you name it, I think speaks for itself. So again, transparency can only deliver the values if we make sure these reports or the information does not lead to self-marketing. And one credible way that we found and we've seen in other sectors is the involvement of multi-stakeholder partnership because by having different interests working together as a group that needs to jointly make decisions as a group you avoid uh, pretty much the, the temptation to say uh, of, uh, of self-marketing and production. Willingness of decision makers to engage is probably the most critical aspect on, on this slide here because even if we get transparency in the public domain even if data is, is published, if nobody afterwards is willing to engage and discuss and challenge what, what they're seeing, we're not, again, making much progress. So one aspect that we see, quite frankly, is we need to bring the discussion of sustainability and integrity in the fishery sector, not just into the fishery sector, but also outside to other sectors to other ministries. And one way, one particular way that we found is quite useful is in countries that have already engaged in a more general open government approach, for example, by signing up to the open government uh, partnership and linking or embedding the commitment to transparency into open government partnership commitment, I think is a, is a really good way of making sure there are more people involved uh, in, in the process. And that directly leads over to my last point, the lack of demand. I personally, and again, um, maybe we can discuss it at the end of the, of the session, I think because fisheries has escaped the spotlight, but also because fisheries is often seen as it's a renewable resource. You know? People don't see the, the priority of, uh, of the sector, um, even though you know, the numbers are out there, uh, Lydia mentioned some, some of them, probably from, from the FAO. There is a lack of interest, and a lack of interest leads to a lack of demand. Uh, and the lack of demand leads to a, a lack of transparency because governments you know, have to juggle many priorities. And if there's no one calling for information on the fishery sector, we do not get um, that push that is needed to really make transparency a valuable mitigation tool to counter corruption. And, other unsustainability um, aspects in the sector. So to, to summarize it with um, three kind of take away home uh, quotes, uh, number one is transparency can be an effective tool to counter corruption in the fishery sector, but we have to recognize fisheries has been slow to the party. Uh, they have been slow to catching on to the transparency wave. We see this in uh, some countries not even publishing basic information. We see it in certain aspects like uh, beneficial ownership. So fisheries really needs a transparency push, a transparency movement um, to fulfill that promise of an effective tool. Um, we should not just talk about transparency in fisheries in general, but make sure we understand it as a comprehensive but tailored approach. If your risk, like uh, Lydia mentioned, if your risk assessment identified that self-dealing of fishing licenses is your key issue, uh, that Minister of Fisheries awards licenses to an organization that is linked uh, to him, then you need different information um, in order to prevent or detect these kind of acts than uh, illegal fishing. And again, to build on what they just said uh, in her I think it was even your, your last uh, slide. Um, we need to increase the understanding of the fishery sector, of transparency, because if we don't uh, increase the understanding, we are not getting 
society-wide oversight possibility, and we may remain with just a few uh, patchy information um, tools or instances. And uh, like I mentioned here, a fool with a tool still remains a fool, and we're losing the oversight that the wider public uh, can bring if we don't increase the urgency and the understanding for um, the fishery sector. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sven. We continue further. Eduard, please continue the discussion. The floor is yours. Thank you, Petra. Uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues. I'm very glad to participate in this event and to see in chat uh, many good colleagues and friends I know for many years. For several years, I was involved in preventing and combating economic crime and corruption in the fisheries. I had meetings with uh, CEOs and shareholders of fishing companies. And the first question I asked myself, why fishing companies use corrupt services? The fisheries is a normal legal business. These companies don't produce and sell drugs or other goods dangerous for the society. Then why do they use corruption? Answering this question is very important for developing and implementing an effective preventive mechanism. I will give three main answers. The first one, the first reason of corruption in the sector is ineffective legal regulation. For example, regulation of taxation or custom duties. Sometimes regulators simply push fishing companies out of the legal business. The second reason is corruption in regulatory authorities. In some countries, or in particular cases, companies don't have any other way to receive quotas for fishing without paying bribe. Please understand me correctly, I'm not trying to justify the misconduct of fishing companies that pay bribe, but trying to explain what are the reasons. What are the reasons for this behavior? Of course, we should also consider particular shareholders and owners of fishing companies they want to increase profits by any means. They prefer to avoid taxes and custom duties. They prefer to do business in shadow zone and pay bribe to protect their business instead of working in a normal legal way. There are various typical criminal activities in the fisheries. My colleagues already described some of them. The serious issue is overfishing. And also in some countries, there is misuse of so-called academic or research quotas for commercial purposes. Basically, for fishing companies that do shadow business, the most important is to receive any kind of quotas for any kind of uh, species of fish basically to have right to catch fish. And these two types of criminal activities are very dangerous. The companies involved in the shadow activities in the fisheries sector use various technical tricks to avoid control and surveillance. We don't have enough time to discuss all these technical issues, but believe me, there is a lot of interesting tricks they do. They also sell fish in the high sea to foreign companies, basically from vessel to vessel, to avoid taxes and custom duties. Some of them also sell fish in foreign harbors without any control. And of course, in both cases, they use corrupt relationships. In such kind of business, they usually use payments to bank accounts in safe havens or simply cash payments. For example, if they simply sell fish from vessel to vessel, they can receive cash from their business partners. Corruption and economic crime in the fisheries. There's many negative consequences. First of all, criminalization of the fishing industry. That is not criminal by its nature. When companies are involved in shadow business, when they don't declare properly the amounts of caught fish, when they don't pay taxes, when they use fake contracts, 
to hide real relationships between them. They usually have no way out. For example, if they have conflicts, they cannot simply go to the court and step by step, they start using services of organized criminal groups to protect them, to help them to resolve conflicts, etc. As a result, organized criminal groups receive additional sources of incomes from the fisheries. It was already mentioned by my colleagues that the serious issue is environmental damage, the loss of population of various fish species. Another problem is loss of revenues for countries. And sometimes there is the problem of bad regulation. I know that some countries requested fishing companies to pay VAT tax, VAT tax, and custom duties almost immediately after crossing custom border. Basically before fishing companies invested a lot of money in vessels, in quotas, in licenses. They had a lot of costs. And some of them simply told me if you would have a chance to sell fish first and then pay taxes and custom duties, we would be more than happy to work in a legal field, work as any normal, comp normal company without violation of legal obligations. But sometimes we simply don't have money to pay immediately all the duties and taxes when we cross the custom border. Simply, if we change the regulation, then companies will do normal business. It's quite an easy solution, but for some countries, this process took years to change the law. One more point. Another issue is the growing prices for fish, for consumers. In my example, when a vessel will simply cross the custom border, of the country and bring fish, it's much cheaper for consumers. But what they do in reality, they simply sell this fish from vessel to vessel, then this fish goes to the harbor of another country. And then for several countries, the same fish goes to the country of origin of the vessel. And finally, it can be a double price for consumer, for the fish, basically caught by the vessel of this country. So next slide, please. What can we do? I fully agree with Sven. The most important point and the best way to solve this problem is to build trust and establish dialogue between regulators and fishing companies. Because we usually think about various law enforcement approaches about control, surveillance, technical mechanisms, tools, etc. But first of all, if we want fishing companies to do normal legal business, we have to discuss with them what are the issues they have, what kind of conditions they need, what we can create, what kind of conditions we create for them to bring them back from the shadow field to the normal legal business. And sometimes the main issue is lack of trust. Of course, not all of them are ready. As I mentioned already, some of them simply want to have highest profit and don't care about laws and regulations. In this case, of course, we have to use law enforcement approach. And I would say that technical surveillance in the fishing zones, including satellite surveillance, is quite effective instrument. I saw many tricks that fishing companies did to avoid control and surveillance. And sometimes it was even funny to see what they do. But generally, for example, satellite surveillance is quite effective. You can see which vessels are in the fishing zone and what exactly they do. And we also use so-called double control because usually the fishing companies involved in shadow activities have good corrupt relationships in the custom service. And it's quite effective to double check when, for example, border control officers control vessels after the custom officers. And sometimes they can identify undeclared fish and also corrupt relationships with custom officers who previously controlled these vessels. 
It's also important to develop control in seaports and international information exchange. Another quite interesting tool, uh, the government authorities, for example, tax inspections, can conduct inspections in fish processing companies to check origin and amounts of proceed fee, proceeded fish, processed fish, sorry. Uh, and then when they identified undeclared fish, then can check the origin and identify fishing companies that sold this fish to the various uh, manufacturers. Finally, it's important to develop cooperation and information exchange between financial intelligence units, anti-corruption authorities, custom and police services. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Edward. We came to the final uh, point uh, before we start with the Q&A session. Uh, and I would like to invite all panelists to uh, share their recommendations uh, uh, and the way forward, the agenda for the future, based on what we have heard. Uh, I would just repeat some of the points that uh, we now heard from, the, from our speakers. What are, what are the main issues from uh, also what Nick mentioned, unreported crimes, uh, and basically that the problems are even bigger than, than we are now discussing. Then the global nature of the uh, fishing industry, which makes it very difficult to, to regulate it as the countries are regulating it uh, uh, every uh, in its own way. So I mentioned beneficial ownership, uh, and uh, now we heard the uh, last point from Eduard. Uh, we also mentioned during the presentation uh, uh, the uh, FAO report, and uh, just one of the uh, points also that was mentioned in the latest one for 2020, uh, it states that uh, regarding the SDG, the situation at 2017 indicates that it's unlikely that the SDG 14.4 to end overfishing of marine fisheries by 2020 will be achieved. So. Uh, now we are practically always already halfway through the year and uh, Sven also mentioned the importance of the effective governance uh, transparency. So what would be your uh, concluding points now before we start with Q&A? What would you recommend uh, each of you? I would first maybe start uh, from the beginning from Nick uh, what would you share now with the audience and what would be your recommendation in this regard? Well, I come from this subject from a operational investigative perspective. And uh, I've come to the conclusion that, I mean, it, it, it is essential um, that we have interagency and um, uh, cross-border cooperation um, to, to tackle whole spectrum of issues in fisheries including including corruption um, organized crime groups are experts at identifying gaps in the systems and uh, legislative legislative lacunas and they will exploit those attacks on the system and uh, what we have to do is identify those by looking along the value chain and I'd, and looking at the, the risks and the gaps between coverage between different agencies, if you I can identify those and uh, institute the sticking plaster, then you're going to reduce the opportunities for uh, criminal attacks on that on, on the system. So we have to and we also have to adopt a holistic approach because to be perfectly honest, um, sanctions for illegal fishing are often weak and they encourage opportunistic behavior it, they don't actually solve the problem um, because um, fishermen treat uh, the administrative fines they receive as part of running their business if you could hit them with other things as well then you're likely to uh, promote a deterrent effect so um, a holistic approach is essential so the, the message is from my perspective is cooperation 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 thank you thank you very much Leda. 
Do you have anything to add from your side? Yeah, from, from my side, I'd like to once again reiterate the importance of going beyond IUU fishing, ensuring that we have uh, two different tracks. There is an administrative track that looks at IU fishing. We need to have a criminal justice track. We need to also look at the other crimes. Sometimes they're easier to prosecute. They are not, they usually uh, occur on land. They occur under one jurisdiction. So sometimes it's easier to go after the related crimes rather than uh, IUU fishing. So it's important to keep that in mind uh, to, to achieve success in, in both. Um, the other one is uh, I fully subscribe to what Nick just uh, mentioned. Cooperation, cooperation, cooperation needs to be um, interagency uh, at the national level. It's key to happen at the regional level uh, and uh, also globally. Uh, related to that is also the need to raise awareness, the need to increase uh, the uh, understanding of what, uh, what these crimes are and also to, to, to make sure that uh, developing countries understand uh, the importance to tackle these issues. And for that, uh, UNODC is uh, working very closely with some of the countries that are champions uh, in, this, uh, in this area, such as Norway, for example, which is also our main donor, uh, and uh, Indonesia. Uh, it's very important that other countries also start recognizing the, the importance of, uh, of fisheries crime. Uh, and uh, lastly, on, on corruption specifically, um, I think uh, it's important to um, keep in mind that prevention is always better than the cure. So uh, it's, uh, it's always good to, to have a preventive approach uh, in, the, in the development of the risk mitigation uh, strategies um, and uh, plans. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leda. Sven. Yeah, I, I don't have any eyebrow raising uh, solution uh, for the future. Uh, quite frankly, nor do I think that we need one. Uh, I think that the two aspects that I would like to highlight. Number one is we need to bring the fishery sector uh, more into the spotlight. Uh, we need to bring it out from being a niche ministry in, in some countries to um, the center of the SDG discussion. Um, the, it's not just its own SDG, SDG 14, but it influences many others. Um, and I think we need to recognize the importance on the fishery sector to uh, reduce poverty in, on the impacts of climate change, uh, etc., in order to create a sense of urgency uh, in, uh, in the sector. But quite frankly, and I'm always struck Struggling a little bit with this, uh, we have corruption uh, agendas. We have uh, discussions on agents when the Bribery Act came out, and now we have we see fisheries agents as a, a key risk in many areas for um, getting fishing authorization. So the elephant in the room is the lack of political will. We know what to do, we have the tools, but we're not implementing them. So how do we increase the political will? I think right now is a tremendous um, opportunity because with the current crisis, it, it showed us what happens if humans interfere too much in, in nature. And I think it, it made it more prominent um, how reliant we are on, on the marine and the ocean uh, environment. So I think if in, in the next months when, again, stimulus packages are put together, the aspect of transparency, the aspect of good governance rules that are not magic, uh, they're you know, technical and mechanical, but we need to implement them. There's a really high chance. So everybody in this call and everybody in, in the panel here, um, we need to further increase that important aspect uh, instead of looking for you know, the magical technology solution or the magical um, otherwise made solution. Thank you very much, Sven. Eduard, do you have any points to be included in the final point? Uh, uh, thank you, Petra. Let me start with a very general point or idea. 
I have a feeling that anti-corruption professionals and fishing companies, industry, need kind of platform for dialogue. And maybe the co-organizer of this event, the International Anti-Corruption Academy and the Fisheries Transparency Initiative, can consider this event as a first step in cooperation and think about establishing kind of joint platform for discussions. That's kind of general idea from my side and uh, coming to the sector's problems. I would say that the key issue is uh, the process, the transparency of the process of distribution of quotas. When companies are involved in corruption already at this stage, then they are automatically involved in corruption in the next stages of their business. And uh, another issue, it was already mentioned here, uh, the process of uh, identification of beneficial owners. There's a lot of discussions and I was part of many of them actually. Uh, the international domestic level, the main issue is um, how to verify the beneficial owners. There are various solutions like registers of beneficial owners in the EU countries, obligation of all companies to know who are the beneficial owners according to the Russian law, uh, but still the main issue is how to avoid the fake beneficial owners, how to identify the old guys behind the companies, between the, behind the long chains of companies in various jurisdictions. Uh, I think we can also discuss it, uh, you know, our platform and discussion forums, etc. What is the way forward? Because we can spend a lot of money, pay a lot of efforts to establish the procedure of identification of beneficial owners. But at the end of the chain, we'll have another front person. That's it. Let's think about and discuss in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eduard. I'm very happy to also to uh, share with you that uh, Professor Dr. Peter Eigen is also with us here. He, so I already asked him, uh, as you know already, uh, Professor uh, Eigen founded the Transparency International. He has really uh, extensive working experience in economic development, in governance for several decades and has led initiative for better global governance and the fight against corruption. I, I already asked him to share with us. He was so kind to accept the invitation to share his experience in promoting multi-stakeholder initiatives against corruption and specific advice to tackle the problem, especially during these challenging times that we are currently in, affected by the pandemic. So, uh, Dr. Eigen, thank you so much for joining us today. And also thank you for uh, accepting our invitation to, to share your experience. Well, thank you very Welcome. much. Thank you very much. Um, I must say I'm delighted about this webinar. I am very grateful for these different dimensions of approaching um, the governance of, uh, of fisheries which have been presented today. So I have learned a lot and I, I really don't want um, uh, to, um, to go into some of the proposals which have been made. Um, of course, the experience which we made with Transparency International during the past uh, 25 years apply very much um, adapted to the fishery sector. So what you said about beneficial ownership, for instance, about um, transparency, about the holistic approach, all these are things which are um, absolutely um, uh, the mantra of Transparency International and can be easily adapted to fisheries. Let me just uh, mention one thing which uh, I think came through all of your presentations so far. And, uh, and Sven put this very clearly again, uh, the lack of political will. I mean, I can tell you um, when I was still the chair of the uh, multi-stakeholder board of uh, FITI, I called quite a number of fisheries ministers and offered our services to them. I mean, I called in Namibia many, many times. In fact, I, I was stationed at one point in Namibia, and therefore I talked to the Minister of Finance several times. He said, please come and help us. But of course, the fisheries minister was not interested. Same thing happened in, in, in Kenya. Uh, I talked uh, to the president of, of, uh, of, of a number of countries, um, but uh, very often the fisheries sector is very protective, it's not very well understood by uh, the other ministries, and, and exactly as uh, some of you have said, it is rather uh, isolated and, um, and therefore uh, not easily accessible. Therefore, I'm particularly interested in one issue, which uh, again has been raised by Eduard at the end uh, here very, very importantly. That is, we need to somehow um, uh, break through this um, uh, credibility gap, which exists in the, in the fisheries sector. Um, there is uh, 
correctly and, and rightly so, a tremendous distrust in the sector uh, of the actors vis-a-vis uh, -vis each, each other. There's tremendous distrust vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the ministries, but also the private sector, and also to some extent, civil society very often overstates their causes and is quite um, extreme in what they want. Therefore, what is extremely important, and, uh, and I would like to emphasize this, even though it came through uh, with all of your presentations, how important it is to have a multi-stakeholder approach in the countries. Uh, not only, as Edouard suggests, um, uh, at the global level, that exists to some extent in the form of the board of the um, the, uh, of FITI, um, but um, also at the global level in organizations like the IACA, but uh, in particular at the local level. And uh, there um, I uh, was not certain whether I understood correctly from, uh, from later uh, what these groups are doing, you know. I mean, I know what they are supposed to do, but how are they composed? Are they mainly civil servants? Are they mainly business representatives? Are they mainly uh, representatives of civil society, or have you found a way of giving credibility uh, to their work by creating true multi-stakeholder working groups? This is what we have tried in the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative. This is what is uh, being uh, applied in many other sectors nowadays. That is to bring together these three important actors in each country, uh, civil society organizations, organized organizations, organizations. Uh, the government, not only government representatives from the country themselves, but also from international institutions um, and, uh, and the business sector. And that is sort of, in my opinion, the mantra of, uh, of FITI. And, um, and I, I want to, to emphasize this. This is the reason why what they produce in these local multi-stakeholder groups in the countries in terms of transparency becomes a credible transparency, a building block for better governance. And, um, and this is why I think I would probably give a bit more emphasis to, to that than um, I have heard so far. Um, because this is, in, in, in my opinion, one of the, uh, the, the true secrets of the success of uh, FITI, that um, in the countries themselves, um, the fishermen and uh, the private sector, uh, and, but also government, and um, uh, civil society come together. So this would be my comment, but I want to thank you tremendously for this event. It is very powerful and, and hopefully we will be able to circulate this uh, to others so that indeed uh, what we have to, to do, like Nick uh, says, uh, cooperate, cooperate, cooperate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Peter Eigen. Of course, we will share the recording as well as slides of today's webinar with the, the audience on our webpage. And also we will share it with FITI as we are organizing the event together. So it will be available for uh, later on for viewing. Thank you so much for accepting the invitation and joining us today. So uh, we can continue with our next uh, question, comments uh, we have with us. Professor also Adam Graker, who is a, a frequent visiting lecturer at IACA, but also a professor of public policy at the University of uh, Adelaide in Australia. Adam, do you hear us? You need to unmute. We can see you already. Okay, welcome. here we are. I'm yes. unmuted. Uh, yes, welcome. And there we go. Um, this has been a wonderful webinar. I'm, uh, I've learned a lot and uh, I think that what we've done, one of the great advantages uh, today is to try to break down the different components of corruption in fisheries. Uh, when I teach in the area, I always start by saying not all corruption is the same. And what we've learned today is that there are many component parts. The, you know, we've talked about bribery, we've talked about extortion, you know, there are many aspects of it. And in order to go forward, one of the very important things to do is to start to pick out um, the things that we can start to work on. And uh, in that way, uh, we can look at what is prevalent, 
what is uh, more common and start to look at the interventions. As Leda said, the important thing is to work on prevention. And then the second thing is to link fisheries into other sectors. There's a lot of work on corruption in sectors. And there are some things that are special about fisheries. Uh, you know, the fish are all under the water. It's nearly all transnational. Uh, it is a mixture of legal and illegal uh, coming together in many different ways. And although fisheries is different to mining or diamonds, as later said, or to urban planning, it's important to pull out the themes that work across all sectors and those that are separate in fisheries. Um, and I'll finish now, but I, one thing I would like to do is to maintain contact. My colleague, uh, Yan Yifei, and I have just, just the last few days published a corruption analysis and ways of developing frameworks of looking at corruption in fisheries. And we'd love to take it on forward uh, further with some very specific case studies uh, if people have them to share with us. Thank you, Petra. Thank you very much, Adam. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you very much for your comments. Uh, I would like to ask uh, our speakers, do they have any uh, comment in regard to the uh, Adam's points. Okay, no one. Uh, we can, I have a, another question that we have received uh, through the chat. Uh, and I would like to read it to you. So, uh, uh, and also open it. Adam, you can also uh, stay here uh, with us. And I would like to address the question. So, uh, please feel free to to uh, uh, answer it. Just a second. Here it is. So, we received uh, through the chat from uh, Stal Suarez uh, a common question. There is a key issue that I believe is important. Governments must engage in more incentive-based actions like market development and support, access to better, cheaper financial resources, certifications, reduction of red tape, etc. Our focus in Ecuador is to change the traditional role of the government from a sole sanctionary and control role to an additional role of first market certifier and facilitator. Use of technology is an enabling tool approach, top-bottom approach. So, would you uh, agree? What would you uh, comment on on this uh, uh, more common than question from our participant from Ecuador? Maybe Sven or uh, Adam. Yep. Yeah. Well, I'll uh, come in here. This uh, comes to the very fundamental question of the role of government and uh, what we're seeing across the world now are governments retreating from uh, taking very active roles in uh, <clears throat> leading industries and it becomes an industry issue. Uh, as Peter Eigen said, political will is very important and so the important thing is to gauge and develop the political will. I mean, Sven made a lot of comments on this. And uh, yes, working with specific governments is a very important thing. To think it can happen universally is probably a bit unrealistic. Sven, did you want to add something? Uh, yeah, I mean, it feeds into what was said earlier. Um, we need to understand uh, the pressure points of, of governments to change certain behavior and, and break through the lack of political will. And I think the, the private sector has set many examples outside of the fishery sector on certification schemes uh, and other uh, sourcing mechanisms where they demonstrate the value uh, sustainable management um, of, the, of the sector. I think there is an increased urgency uh, on the private sector side when it comes to fisheries because the statistics are getting worse and worse. And uh, eventually, there's nowhere to source the fish from. Uh, and I think in, in that sense, uh, yes, uh, I agree. Uh, there are many aspects that we need to consider when it comes to market-based uh, incentives. Um, also the negative 
unintended consequences. But in general, I, I agree that we need to, um, we need to have a somewhat of a carefree approach uh, to, to move the sector forward. And we're not going to make it with just one of them, but a combined approach of both, I think, is something that we need in, in the fishery sector to see, uh, to see more often. Thank you very much, Sven. We have, uh, even though we are already uh, beyond 90 minutes, we will finish soon. But before we do, we have another question uh, from one of the, from Mr. Awad El Karim. Awad, do you hear us? Yes. Welcome, and uh, please, uh, you can ask your question now. We can hear you. Uh, uh, my question is, uh, how is the legal enforcement framework addressed corruption in fisheries into the context of criminal or civil provisions? The legal enforcement framework addressed corruption in fisheries, either in the context of criminal or civil uh, provision. The other question is the international fisheries laws has an instrument on fisheries management, both binding or, or non-binding. Thank you very much, uh, Avad. Mr. Peter? Yeah, I if, I, mm -hmm. if I may say a few words about uh, the, the role of, uh, of national governments and the private sector in fisheries. I mean, this is something which is extremely important also for fighting corruption in general in many other sectors. There we have simply noticed that the capacity of national governments to shape the globalization, to shape governance uh, beyond the national borders is extremely limited. And that's in particular the case in the fisheries because fish don't really recognize uh, any borders. And therefore, um, uh, we have simply um, developed a concept where we have to support national governments, but also uh, uh, the international organizations, intergovernmental organizations like the United Nations, we have to support them by bringing in these other actors. And the other two actors relevant in this connection are, um, on the one hand, the private sector, which has um, no uh, geographic limitations in terms of their reach. They are all over, over the world in every sector, uh, in particular the big companies. But also to bring in um, civil society organizations, which also have a much um, a broader um, uh, uh, operational field and have a different time horizon. Uh, many national governments, for instance, are very much limited to their uh, electoral uh, periods and therefore they have a time horizon uh, to the end of the re-election of the, the powerful people in the country. While many of the issues of global governance have a very long-term time horizon. So this is why I believe very strongly that fisheries is particularly uh, um, in need of a multi-stakeholder approach where governments um, who have the authority to uh, uh, and the legitimacy uh, to pass laws and so on um, get together with the private sector and get together with civil society organizations like like uh, like transparency international or like uh, greenpeace and so on and work with them in each situation to come to a common approach to what is good in the governance uh, and whether the nation states want to use a, a criminal approach to, to sanction uh, poor behavior or whether they want to uh, use um, a civil law approach or an administrative approach. This is something which is uh, secondary. This is a, a functional issue. Um, and I must say uh, in the fight against corruption, I normally uh, advise against overestimating the importance of criminal law because uh, criminal law is very, very blunt weapon, you know, if you, you have the burden of proof if you want to sanction somebody, while in all the other areas, a normal uh, degree of proof is sufficient. So, I mean, this would be my response to these issues, but I, I think uh, uh, the multi-stakeholder approach at the local level, but also at the global level, is in my opinion, the key to creating a fair and sustainable uh, governance system worldwide. Thank you very much, Mr. Eigen. I would also ask our speakers if they want to add uh, anything else, especially in regard to the uh, 
last question that we have received from uh, Mr. Vaad El Karim regarding the law enforcement. Edward, do you want to maybe add something? Adam? Yeah. Uh, Edward? No, of course, uh, governments use both uh, criminal law approach as criminal liability for the particular offenses related to crime, specific crime in the fisheries sector and related corruption crime, uh, general corruption crime in the sector. They use also uh, administrative law approach. It depends, of course, uh, on the gravity of offenses of misconduct. But I fully agree with uh, Peter that uh, the most important is uh, to establish dialogue and to establish proper regulation. Because we can arrest all the shareholders and fishers, but who will catch fish in this case? Of course, it's not the good solution. First of all, we have to create good conditions for them to do business. And then we can apply criminal law approach and administrative sanctions to those of them who don't want at any way to work in the legal field, to work properly. And another point, uh, I think in this question, the importance of information exchange. It's a very technical question, but still, sometimes uh, I would say, speaking from a very practical perspective, it's very difficult to receive information from the uh, foreign seaports about uh, amount of fishes, about um, amount of fish sold in these in this ports, uh, from the control authorities, from the supervisory bodies. The information exchange is not really effective yet. And uh, quite often the uh, companies involved in shadow business in the fisheries sector use these opportunities, take advantage, and uh, we have to think how to increase effectiveness of information exchange about amounts of fish sold in various uh, seaports. Yes. Thank you very much, Edward. Uh, coming with one quick point about government and not, we've got to remember, not all governments have the capacity to deal with uh, multinational and with uh, transnational issues. Uh, I'm speaking to you now from Australia. Uh, we're in the South Pacific and in our region are many, many small island states. And some of these very, very small countries, you know, can only afford one uh, patrol boat. They can't go chasing after, in a law enforcement way, some of the big fishing factories that come. Furthermore, many countries, many of the small island states in the South Pacific uh, have only two real sources of revenue. One is foreign aid, and the second is fishing licenses. And this creates enormous potential for corruption, for policy capture, for uh, ways of using aid, particularly by some of the larger countries who have a lot of fishing boats, uh, to manipulate the whole process. And the governments very often do not have the capacity. So this is where civil society has a very important role to play and the partnership, cooperation are ultimately important. Thank you very much, Adam. We have uh, another question. We can receive still uh, in total two questions. We are really uh, behind the time. And uh, I would like to ask Ivan now, Ivan. Please, Hello, you are live. Thank you. Hi, Petra. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you. So, uh, I, hello, I'm Ivan Zupan. I work for Transparency International. So, somebody had to uh, uh, ask this, so I'm going to be me. So, COVID-19, of course. So, uh, my question to the panelists is, uh, so I think we in the anti-corruption sector, we fear that the COVID might have, let's say, uh, reduced uh, the interest of the, the political will and the interest in the corruption sector. I was quite uh, surprised when Sven said that uh, the anti-corruption in fisheries was uh, fall under the radar for so long time. So my question is, uh, what do you think that the, the COVID will have a negative impact of what has already been done in this sector? And whether do you, do you see a, 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 a decreased political will and also funds available? And as a follow-up question is, what would be the messaging that you would still advance to a government official to, to keep up the, the fight? Thank you, Ivan. 
Do we have any volunteers? Nick, please. Um, on the COVID-19 uh, uh, point, um, the North Atlantic Fisheries Intelligence Group has just completed an analysis of the impact of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic on the fisheries value chains within the North Atlantic area. Um, they are significant, uh, but we don't know whether they are permanent or temporary, but there have been significant shifts in the movements of fish, the type of fish being sold and moved, um, uh, and, and the uh, export routes um, outside the EU, for example, they've been significant. Now, uh, and interestingly, there's been a, a significant increase in direct sales through, through e-commerce and um, social media from boats direct to the general public. So this has been a, a major shift, not only in Europe, but in Canada and the United States. Now, now those shifts in the how fish is sold clearly has impacts on uh, compliance um, of fisheries and landing data, etc. So we're, we're yet to see how that those changes are going to uh, manifest themselves, but COVID-19 has had a significant impact on uh, how fish has been moved, what fish has been sold, how it's been transported, what is being transported. And uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's been a very interesting and very dramatic and very quick change. What, what impact it has on uh, non-compliance, again, is yet to be seen clearly. Um, direct observation of fishing activities was uh, reduced or uh, just ceased uh, because during the course of the pandemic and clearly people took opportunities to uh, do things they perhaps shouldn't do uh, because they weren't being monitored um, but we will have to see whether we can see uh, that in the uh, data going forward but um, yes COVID-19 has had a significant impact, but uh, what long-term impact it's going to have, we don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Sven, would you like to add also a point? Yeah, um, quick. I mean, the overarching question, whether governments will uh, put good governance aside uh, and just focus on an economic recovery at, let's say, at all costs, um, that's probably the, could be the session of another webinar altogether. What I want to add is um, I think while we are still in many parts of the world in a health crisis, uh, we will move even further in an economic crisis. And I think fishery sector will come significantly uh, under pressure to um, generate economic income um, that has been lost in other sectors. And I think that's in particular uh, aspect if we look at uh, the small island developing states they are in general not only heavily depending on fishing uh, but most of them are even more heavily depending on tourism and I am currently based in the Seychelles and you know and you know, the GDP of the Seychelles is to 60% made up of tourism income and there are no tourists right now in the Seychelles the country is opening up etc so um, has that increased um, pressure on the fishery sector not yet. Will it come? I would assume it will at least be uh, be discussed. So we are already facing, you know, dreadful numbers. If we look at the last FAO report of almost 34 plus percent um, fish at unsustainable biological levels, you know, this should not be the time now to make the fishery sector again, you know, the, the primary recovery sector to to fix economy. But in many economies around the world that depend on fishing, that may just be the, the only source. So the sustainability aspect is so important to constantly bring this to the attention and not sacrifice uh, long-term goals with uh, short-term gains. But it is, it is difficult. It is really difficult. Thank you very much, Sven. May I add some points? Yes, please, Edward. 
Yeah, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, yes, definitely uh, this COVID crisis will have negative effect on economic crime and corruption, including fisheries sector. Uh, the last Interpol's and uh, Europol reports published um, in the recent months demonstrated an increased uh, number of fraud cases and corruption cases. And actually, there are two negative trends. First of all, the criminal groups uh, acting in various uh, areas of criminal activities lost a lot of funds as well as normal businessmen, and they will try to compensate their losses and increase their activities. And at the same time, Many companies in many countries are in a very difficult situation now. And it means many of them, they will take care, first of all, about new customers. And it means that can decrease the level of compliance. They will try to save money that usually they spend for compliance and probably they will apply lower standards when they decide to do or not to do business with particular uh, third parties. In general, it can have negative effects in the fisheries sector as well. Thank you very much, Eduard. We will now take the last question we have with us. Uh, Mr. Bruce Zagaris, do you hear us, Bruce? Yes, um, my question um, responds to Peter Eigen's comment about the lack of capacity in these countries. So I'm wondering to what extent are the regional economic integration groups trying to develop and are developing policies and also are pooling enforcement resources to take action on these things. So we have, for instance, in the Caribbean, CARICOM or West Africa, we have ECOWAS, um, different economic integration groups. So to what extent are they um, acting in this, in this area? Do you want me to briefly respond to that, uh, Petra? Yes, please, please, well, Mr. I mean, I'm um, very much in favor of these regional arrangements, in particular right now in Europe, for instance, we have a very good regional arrangement. But um, one has to recognize that the participants, the nation, the national governments participating in these regional arrangements, including, by the way, also in global uh, intergovernment organizations, they operate uh, basically on the lowest common denominator. I mean, we have seen this right now, you know, we are not able to tell um, the Hungarian government that they have to apply uh, a rule of law and so on, if they want to have part of this 1.8 trillion uh, dollar package, which, which is being distributed right now. So, I mean, they are simply dependent on the help of the other two actors of the private sector, which operates all over the world. I mean, these big um, uh, companies like Apple and, and Facebook and so on, they are all over the world. For them, borders mean nothing. Um, while national governments they are limited uh, geographically and therefore their interest is, um, is rather parochial. Their constituencies are rather dis dispersed. And even in the United Nations, which of course I love, you know, it's a very important organization, but we see how they fail uh, to find answers because each of the participating countries and not only the big veto powers in the, uh, in the Security Council, they operate on their own national um, uh, basis. And this is um, why, um, uh, why I still believe that if we want to have global governance in sectors like fisheries, we need a very strong uh, multi-stakeholder approach where national governments are supported and also regional organizations are supported by civil society organizations and the private sector. Thank you very much, Mr. Eiken. If we don't have any other comments from other speakers, I would like to wrap up our webinar today's webinar as we went way beyond uh, uh, expected time but I'm very happy that we did because the discussion was really fruitful very interesting engaging for our participants and also panelists thank you very much uh, once again to all the speakers and uh, also to our uh, co-organizers Fiti thank you very much Sven for accepting the invitation to put together an event like that
Uh, I really want to say big thanks to my former colleague, Mr. Martin Zapata, who is currently working for the FITI and is a Latin America Regional Coordinator. Thank you, Martin. Uh, and uh, I'm really looking forward to our future events uh, on this topic. Uh, as I understand, uh, there uh, are many more things to be done and uh, we shall look closely on the developments and we uh, at AYACA will be very much uh, uh, looking forward to organizing events in the near future on the related topic. Thank you all. Uh, please uh, uh, register, also check our uh, upcoming webinar for the next week. Uh, registrations are open on minimizing uh, bribery and corruption in the time of pandemic with Mr. Drago Kos and other esteemed speakers. We are very much looking forward to host you again next week. Stay in touch and uh, please check our webpage for the recorded version also uh, I know that we have some still questions open. We will share it with our speakers and we will be happy to share their answers with you uh, also post-event. So many thanks once again. It was a pleasure to uh, have you today with us and uh, see you next week when we have a new webinar coming. Thank, Thank you, Peter, you for moderating this so superbly. Thank you. Yeah. Thank I you. was uh, very honored. Thank you. Bye-bye.